It's great to be here. Um, Scott and Tony Weissman are, are very curious guys. Uh, it's, it's a testament that, to them that they got interested in what, uh, what I've been working on as early as they did. Uh, we, live, we live in what I call a post-TV or a post-cable era. Um, it's really dramatic. I liken it to the guy in the big short that was sort of ranting and, and telling you obvious stuff, but by the same token, it sort of surprised everybody. It's a cataclysm. Uh, it, it's over by any possible measure. If you look at the right column here, you can see these are declines in percentage of viewership of people 18 to basically 34. Um, you know, even up to 49, you can see declines of anywhere from 20 to 50 percent in television viewing over the past six years. It, it's, it's like a retirement home um, that's watching this content. Uh, every time I tell these numbers, it's like I'm inventing cold fusion. People are surprised by them. They're in, the, they're in the press all the time. Nielsen puts it out all the time. There's a lot of people that have a vested interest in not admitting to the facts and the reality. There are two possible bets of what happens in the future. The first bet is that the future has highly produced dramas and comedies and little crap on Facebook. That is basically the conventional wisdom that you will watch House of Cards, Transparent, content from HBO, you'll do appointment viewing, you'll watch crap, and there will be no live cable news, there will be nothing, there'll be nothing linear, there'll be nothing ambient, there'll be no window on the world type content. I disagree with that, and I think that that's uh, a bet that I'm, I'm gonna go against. You did not wake up a year ago and say, oh, if only there was little shitty content on Facebook with text on the screen that caught my eyes with something exploding or salacious in the first two seconds. I'm just, I'm dying for that kind of content. I wanna watch Kevin Spacey dramas and crap. That wasn't any kind of impulse that you had. Facebook did something to the news feed that played to our desire for Big Macs and then basically fed everybody as many Big Macs as possible. I mean, they call it engagement, but we really know what engagement is. Uh, it's, it's, it's addiction, basically. Um, the content's not good, nobody wanted it. It's an artifact of a system, and that's why people watch it. My bet is that ambient, linear, non-appointment viewing, the stuff that you watch while you get dressed, in your office, bathing your kids, cooking dinner, filing your taxes, working on papers, the stuff that you watch where the impulse is what's going on in the world, what did the president do, what happened with Tesla today? What's that new thing that Amazon announced? What's going on with Uber? There's a, a form factor of content that lives in that space that needs to get rebooted for people under the age of 60. And that's what we've effectively done with Cheddar. We've tried to create a, a live news network that focuses on technology, media, business, and culture. We broadcast eight hours a day live from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. We're on all the major OTT systems. We're on Twitter as part of that new programming initiative they announced earlier this week. We're on Sling TV, we're on Amazon, creating news which answers that need for an entirely new generation. And we're seeing large audiences. We're capturing the zeitgeist. The first day that we broke a million viewers was the day of the Snapchat IPO where we covered it from all the different angles and its cultural significance. We're starting to get congressmen and congresswomen and senators and representatives to come on because they know that if they want to reach someone other than retirement homes, they got to find a new place to go. And this past week, we even had Governor Hickenlooper on uh, from Colorado talking about his re recent meeting with the Attorney General uh, about cannabis uh, deregulation. So what does this all mean and where do we go from here as media creators and content creators? When a, when a platform comes to you, like, I wasn't gonna call them out by name, but what the fuck. When YouTube gives you advice, it's basically always that you should make your content BuzzFeed. Now, I love BuzzFeed, I worked there, but if we do what these platforms tell us to do, we all become the same stuff. And inevitably, they change what they want. Facebook liked to push games. Then they got tired of games, they pushed links. Then they got tired of links and they pushed instant articles. Then they got tired of instant articles and they pushed live video. Then they got tired of live video and they pushed short video. Now they're tired of short video because they can't fit ads in it and they're gonna go to long video. The format is the content for them. No one knows what any of the content or the sources are on Facebook and Facebook wants it that way. So back in third grade, when everybody told you you weren't cool or you needed to wear those 
different shoes or whatever, and you went to the therapist, and they told you to walk into the bathroom and hug yourself and say, I love me, that's what you have to do. You guys know I had a troubled childhood. Uh, <laughs> I didn't play sports. I loved computers. It was not an easy time. Uh, this is actually what they, you, you say to the platform, I'll change it 10%. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal today where Snapchat is giving detailed notes to content creators. That sounds like the fucking worst thing ever. I want to make my content. People either like it or not like it. But one thing I know for sure, at least I'm going in my direction, and I would urge you all to do the same. This is what happens when you listen to these platforms. Jason Kent, Digital Content Next, smart guy, trade organization. He did a survey of large publishers. These are some big sites. These are not tiny sites. These people made in total $8 million in the first half of the year through checks from distributed content sites, largely Facebook, Snapchat, and YouTube. It doesn't work out well for you. My favorite Twilight Zone episode. You guys, some of you guys know the punchline. They get the book, the aliens come down, they're super excited, they're not sure about the aliens' motives, but they are able to translate the cover of the book, and it's to serve man, and they're very excited. The aliens are here to serve us. Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers, don't get on that ship. The rest of the book, to serve men, it's, it's a cookbook. No, 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 All right, you get it. No, no. The, the saying is, if you don't know what's for dinner, you're what's for dinner. Uh, this is what Facebook has done, basically. The chicken is delicious. It's amazing. Who wouldn't want that whole roasted chicken for dinner, right? But when it's in an aisle of Lucky Charms and Pop-Tarts and Twinkies, it's like, ah, oh, do I really want to cook it? Do I really want chicken? And all the other colors are so exciting and vibrant, and your head becomes scrambled eggs. And before you know it, all you're doing is eating Twinkies and Pop-Tarts. Great content needs a clean, well-lighted place, to quote Hemingway. This is where this kind of content works. Our partnership with Sling, the largest OTT television service in the United States. We're next to CNN, we're next to Bloomberg, we're next to Newsy. If you're looking for news, you go there, you see news. You don't see cats doing backflips into swimming pools. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you can't make this stuff compete against that. Um, or Pluto TV, six million users. We're, we're neighborhooded here, Young Turks, CNBC, MSNBC. Twitter does something very interesting. I'm a massive Twitter fan. They're my partner, and they've done a phenomenal job. They do what's actually almost like a linear neighborhooding. Bloomberg is on. After Bloomberg, Cheddar comes on. Later in the day, their show, The Rally in Sports, comes on. They announced five new slates of programming, 12 new shows uh, a couple days ago. It makes sense. If you want news and to know what's going on in the world, you would go to Twitter to see that. You wouldn't expect to go to an area where you'd be distracted by nonsense. What do you do to make this work? First of all, there are audiences everywhere for this kind of stuff. When I started this, people said there wouldn't be a large enough audience for millennial interest in business news. As you can see, we found exactly the opposite. People are interested in everything. The audiences everywhere are big enough. The talent needs to be young and look like the people that are watching it. Look, all of these anchors at these major networks, it's the last rodeo. <laughs> Matt Lauer's gonna fucking die in that seat, okay? <laughs> Why would he give that up? Where else is he going to make $20 million a year? So what that means is the talent is backed up. No one in their 20s is ever getting on television, and no one in their 60s is ever giving up the seat. We need to program with people for the audience. It's not that hard. Make it visually vibrant. They're coming there to see what's going on in the world. Don't give them a green screen or some basement studio. We're at the Stock Exchange. We're in the Flatiron Corner. We're opening a studio in, um, in LA. We're at the White House. A final thought. I like the Frank Lloyd Wright quote, form follows function. Where we put our content, how we neighborhood, how we organize it, is as important as the content itself. And allowing these platforms to dictate it has not ended so well for us so far. So I would encourage everybody, stick to your guns, make the content that you want, and let the world come around to you. Thanks, everybody.